All right, let's go ahead and get started the, today. Don't forget that the first exam is on Tuesday. So uh, make sure you're getting ready for that. Um, don't forget, uh, I want to let you know that I will be checking my email um, through the weekend. So if you have any questions if, as you're studying over the weekend, um, I'll be in my office tomorrow. I'll be in my office Monday, of course. Um, so if you need to come by and, and uh, ask questions, talk to me about uh, something, just let me know uh, what I can do to help you as you prepare for it. Don't forget the study guide is posted on Blackboard. So today we are in Chapter 7. And as we noted on Tuesday, Chapter 7 is that break between the first six seals and the seventh seal. And there'll be a similar pattern in um, later chapters when we get to the seven trumpets. We'll see the first four really quickly, five and six, a little bit more in depth, and then a break, and then the seventh. And particularly in this break, um, there are two intermediate visions. Okay. So the two intermediate visions in chapter 7 are not part of the sixth seal. They are separate. But they are also meant to kind of be consoling visions. The visions offered there um, kind of signal a break between the first six seals, which were very um, you know, uh, intense. Right? There's a lot of violence and, and um, warfare things like that, I mean, earthquakes, those kind of things that we talked about at the end on Tuesday. And so these visions are meant to be um, consoling visions <clears throat> given to John's audience to kind of say, yes, all of this is going to happen, but God's going to take care of you in the midst of all that. So before we get into that, let's go ahead and take the time to read it. If somebody would read uh, verses 1 through 8. And then somebody else pick up and read 9 through 17. 1 through 8 and 9 through 17. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea. Or on any tree. I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond service of our gods on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. And the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Nassau, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the land, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and the land. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. 
So the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So, these visions here, two separate visions, but I believe two that are interconnected. It starts off, however, with four angels, four wings, and four corners. And so, John sees, again, that, that idea of, of seeing, looking, will appear several times throughout uh, this chapter as well. Sees four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds. So, what's suggested by this repetition of four? Right, so totality, completion of what? All right, so the entire world, and you know, the idea of you know the entire world being under God's control. Does that mean there there are angels connected with wind? Well, I don't know. Right? We, we don't want to press this too far, but the symbolic thing is that God is present everywhere, even in the form of angelic servants. Right? So you get um, the four quarters. Now, one of the things that we talked about on Monday, excuse me, Tuesday was the connection between the four horsemen with Zechariah chapter 6, which talks about four groups of horses connected to chariots. Flip back over to Zechariah chapter 5, or excuse me, chapter 6, which is the passage we referred to on Tuesday. And notice there in verse 5, when Zechariah asks, who are these, referring to the, the chariots and the horses, uh, the angel answered me, these are the four winds of heaven going out after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. So is there a connection to be made here in Revelation between the four winds and the four horsemen from the four, first four seals? Because in Zechariah chapter 6, which serves as kind of the inspiration or the background for the four horsemen, there's a connection made between the chariots and the winds. You know, so does the holding back of the four winds refer to the prevention of the four horsemen doing their activity? And hold, or holding back the winds until a certain time. Now, of course, we, the other thing we have to think of here as well, with this idea of the protection that's offered, is that we don't necessarily have to think of this as linear time. Because many people will say it appears like the events of chapter 7 would precede chapter 6, right? This protection that's going to take place before, right? So it's kind of a little tiny wani here, right? With this idea of holding back the four winds until, I'm, I knew some of you did that, <laughs> um, holding back the four winds until the, the, the people of God are protected. So whatever the, whatever the winds are, they have to be restrained for a time. And so that's what's going on here, this protection, this prevention. Now, does John really think the earth has four corners? Right? Does he think that, that the earth is a square? Um, because I'm sure there would be some people who say, see, look at the Bible, it's so backwards, it thinks the earth is square. Okay, there are biblical passages that talk about the earth as a circle. There are biblical passages that talk about the earth as a sphere. You know, so don't take this as John having no clue what shape the earth is in. But we frequently use the term, like, four corners, right? They came from the four corners and all those kind of things to suggest right, the totality. It doesn't mean that John actually, or the Bible actually teaches that the earth is a square. It's a metaphor for everywhere, right? They're, they're, they're kind of connected everywhere. Good. Uh, I was just going to say, I've heard somebody uh, say that, like, if you took the map, it seems like the world and just laid it flat for these four corners, and that's what it's talking about. That's just an interpretation I've heard. I don't know if that would be. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, one of the things that I don't think we have to worry about is trying to trying to justify John here. I mean, we, we frequently use language that that isn't scientifically accurate. Anybody talking about the sun rising and setting, it's scientifically wrong. The sun does not rise and set. But we use that kind of terminology. Well, the same kind of thing's going on here. John's talking about the four corners of the earth. It doesn't mean that he thinks there's literally 
four corners to the earth. Speaking of the rising sun, John sees another angel. Right? So he sees, he's seen four angels, now he sees another angel, and this angel is ascending from the rising of the sun. So, the east. There's been a lot of, you know, as, as I have work through you know, comparing and everything, there's a lot of question of why the East? Why is this why is this angel rising from the East? Um, you know, and of course the question or the many people say of course, well the, the sun, right, connected with the sun. Other people say, well later on we'll see some demonic activity coming from the East, and so maybe it's there. You know, I don't know that there's necessarily anything deeply symbolic about the fact that this angel is from the rising of the sun. Right? It's just kind of, John's kind of seeing the earth, and he just kind of sees an angel coming up from the east. It doesn't seem like there's um, anything significant of that. What is significant about this angel is what the angel carries. The angel carries the seal of the living God. Now, one of the things, of course, to think about this is the seal that this angel is taught that this angel has is the mirror opposite of the seals we've been looking at in chapter six. In chapter six, the seals we referred to there were wax, you know, blobs of wax onto which a seal, a stamp, has been pressed. Right? And so this is the thing that makes the impression. So by carrying the seal of the living God, he's carrying the stamp. And we've been looking at the wax in chapter 6. Of course, this is an angel that carries a lot of great honor because he carries God's seal. Now, by carrying God's seal, what does, what does that mean? What does it mean to carry the seal of, of God or the king or anything like that? Yeah. All right, their blessing, they have their authority. Right? You, you carry their power. Right? The, you're kind of authorized to do certain things in their name. The other passage that I, I thought of as I was preparing for today and thinking about the seal of the living God is a passage from the book of Hebrews. Right? So not something that's necessarily um, a background or foundation passage, but one that's kind of contemporary to John that also talks about this idea of the seal of the living God uh, in a sense. And uh, somebody read uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, please. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. Who's the he there that's being talked about in Hebrews chapter 1? Jesus, right? And so this discussion of Jesus being the exact imprint is kind of that seal type imagery, right? That, that if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. He's like the imprint, like what would happen if a seal was pressed into wax. So God being pressed in the flesh is what Jesus is. And so he carries the seal of the living God. And of course, like many of the angels, calls out with a loud voice. There probably is something significant here, because this phrase, calls out with a loud voice, or something similar, appears quite frequently with these angels. There's something being proclaimed. It's something that, that you should pay attention to. Right? It's not just a statement being made, but something that is um, of great significance. 